Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. I'm Patrick Spencer. I'll be your host tonight. We've got a great show for you tonight. We've got uh, uh, Ron Hedden is here to talk about astro imaging, astro image processing with free software. Um, and but before we get to the to the presentation, let's just take a quick look at the calendar. Share here. All right. So yeah, so tonight we've got uh, we've got Ron, and then uh, next week we've got Niels Hay here to talk about astrophotography using uh, Alt as mounts. So that ought to be interesting. Uh, and then coming up on August 27, we've got our TAIC workshop with the uh, the really neat data that we uh, got from from Kevin Moorefield. Um, and let me just pull that up here uh, quickly here on the workshop page. So this is the the data that he supplied, um, and we've had a number of folks submit uh, submit their processed images, and so I think we should have a really nice show uh, next week. And Kevin's going to join us as well to talk a little bit about the the data as well. Uh, and so today was the deadline to submit for for that uh, for that workshop. So uh, it, we've we've we're essentially closed on that, but uh, the data is still out there, and so I would certainly encourage anyone uh, to. If you're interested to download this data, it's great data, uh, and you can process it. Uh, and and not only that, but we you can see here we've got uh, essentially all the uh, previous workshops that we've that we've done in the past. That data stays up and it stays available. So, for instance, uh, we've got the California Nebula and uh, Terry's data of the Tarantula Nebula and and uh, a number of data sets going back quite a ways. Uh, and so certainly those uh, those give folks a chance to process things that you might not uh, might not otherwise be able to image, particularly some of the some of the southern hemisphere targets. So uh, all right, so just back to the calendar then. Um, after the workshop, we've got Sean Walker coming to talk about the uh, All Sky Hydrogen Alpha uh, Sky Survey, and uh, Tom Palmer will be here to talk about the new target scheduler in Nina. So I imagine a number of folks are looking forward to hearing about that. Uh, and we're pretty well booked up here in into uh, November, at least the beginning of November. I will point out that we we don't have a show on uh, October fifteenth because we. Do have the the eclipse, the annular eclipse that weekend, uh, but other than that, uh, but if you see here going into the middle of November, we do have open dates. So anybody out there, if you've got an idea for a presentation, something that you'd like to uh, to come on the show and and tell us about, we'd certainly love to have you. So you can just hit that contact button and send us an email, and we'll we'll get in touch with you and see what see about getting you on the show. All right. Let me stop sharing that. So, um, so as I said, next week's presenter, uh, uh, Niels Hay, was was kind enough to join us. Actually, all the way from from Denmark, where it's uh, three in the morning or three thirty in the morning, I suppose, some ungodly hour like that. Uh, and so, uh, Niels, would you mind just telling us just a, a little bit about what your presentation will cover next week? Yes, I can say a few words about it. Well, you can say it is um, the tradition uh, always to use polar align mounts when you do amateur astrophotography. And in the present presentation, I will uh, try to point to the situation where it makes good sense instead to use an LDAS mount. After that, I'll try to uh, explain why it makes sense and uh, what the, the benefits are from using an LAS mount. And then finally, I will uh, go into more details about how you uh, use an LAS mount for astrophotography. And that will be with um, focus on the use of uh, field derotators and the aspects of, of guiding that is a bit different from what you do on a, on a polar alignment equatorial mount. So I'd say uh, whether you are a newcomer wanting to start taking um, astrophotos with your LDAS mount or you are an experienced astro imager, it should be uh, something for everybody to, to, to learn.
So I look, I'm looking forward to do the presentation. Thank you. Great. Yeah, we're looking forward to that too. That should be that should be really neat, and it, it'd be nice to hear. It's always nice to hear things like you talked about that are a little bit outside of the the traditional boxes that we that we tend to uh, tend to find ourselves in. So. All right, so that then brings us to tonight's speaker, Ron, uh, and, and certainly it's not news to anyone who's watching this channel that uh, our astrophotography hobby is expensive. Uh, and even with things that, that we think are, are cheap, uh, or maybe I should say cheaper, uh, I suppose, in a relative sense, uh, but the price tags on those things would frequently still raise eyebrows of, of anyone who's not into, uh, into astrophotography. And if you don't believe me, just uh, try telling one of your non-astrophotographer friends how much you spent on your imaging rig and watch their eyes pop out. So, uh, so, so certainly we're all interested. We'd all like to save money wherever we can. Uh, and of course, there's really not uh, not free options for for hardware, uh, but there are a number of of free choices when it comes to software. And so Ron's here tonight to help us sort through that. So, uh, Ron, if you're ready to uh, start your presentation, we can. I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I appreciate you guys inviting me, and I'm going to try to make the best out of the presentation. And it's mostly aimed at beginning and intermediate imagers who perhaps are not quite ready to invest a lot of money in software. Uh, I would say I started imaging in the late 1990s myself with a film camera. And like so many people, I decided that I should start off with a 2000 millimeter focal length Schmidt Cassegrain and use a hand paddle guider. It's probably the worst thing I could have done. And uh, I gave up after about a year, uh, mostly because of the auto guiding, but also because of the pain and suffering involved in film developing. Uh, so along about 2012, I suddenly realized that CCD cameras had gotten a lot better. The sensors were a lot larger and you could purchase them for amounts of money that were not completely unreasonable. So I decided to dive back in. I'm really glad I did because I've never stopped since. But um, after collecting my very first data set, and uh, I quickly realized that was only part of the game. And in order to get a finished image out of it, I was going to have to learn some processing software, which was not included with my camera. And if I wanted to do something like Photoshop, I had to pay for it. Uh, and there are more expensive things you can do yet. So I was a little bit aggravated after making that investment, and I decided to see if I could have a go at processing with free software. And uh, just the history was after two or three years, I was being told there were other software packages that could do a better job, and maybe I should invest in some of this and some of that. And so I distributed one of my data sets to a few friends and they processed it with their software. And what ended up happening was their versions were different, but not necessarily better than what I got in the free software, which was really eye-opening. I looked at them and I said, hey, I can do the same thing with the software. I just need to increase the saturation, darken the sky background a little bit, stretch it a bit different, and now it looks just like yours. And um, I've tried a few of the pay packages, the trial versions over the years, and I just didn't want to embark on the learning curve to switch over from what I already know. So all this time, I've actually just added programs and added programs to my free uh, image processing software suite. And I've never really looked back. So uh, I do own a couple of noise reduction programs that cost me a few bucks that I'm not going to talk about tonight because they do a nice job. But my main processing workflow takes place in GIMP, the open source image editor. So it's kind of like Photoshop, but it's freeware. And I use a whole host of accessory programs that are freeware, shareware, et cetera, that have been graciously donated to the community for you to use for processing your images. Um, so just to give a little scope of the presentation, I do all of my processing in Windows, 
with apologies to people that use Macs. Um, I don't know if all these software packages run the same way on Mac, and I cannot answer that question, so I have to say that up front. I'm focusing on mono imaging process, image processing tonight. So if you image with a one-shot color camera, you may have to skip over a few steps, but you're still going to be able to get a lot out of what I'm going to show. Uh, and one of the biggest things I have to cover if you're going to go with multiple programs instead of having it all in one package is passing TIFF files between multiple programs, which is probably the biggest headache that I've had to overcome during the years. Uh, export a file from GIMP, for example, and find out that the next program I want to use in the workflow can't open it, and I just get an error message. Uh, it's once been said by an unknown person that TIFF stands for thousands of incompatible file formats. I found that very funny and very true. Uh, there is no standard for TIFF. There are many kinds of TIFFs out there, and uh, they have, all have the same file extension on your computer. But some programs will open another program's TIFF file, and some won't. So I've got to get that through loud and clear, and I'll show you how to deal with it in GIMP. Uh, the presentation has two parts. Uh, in the first one, I'm going to actually do a complete workflow for the NGC 55 data set that Terry Robeson uh, graciously donated for the TAIC workshop on February 6, 2023. And if you missed that broadcast, you can catch it on YouTube. It's still up there. And you can see how various people processed his very nice data set, which I believe was taken from a dark site in Australia that's much better and much drier than any dark side I have here uh, on the New York-Vermont border. Uh, the second part of the presentation, time permitting, I'm going to show you how to do an HOO narrow band composition in GIMP. And a lot of people image from light polluted skies, and they might like to just do narrow band. Uh, but how do you get a colored narrow band composition that doesn't look terrible using GIMP as your main workhorse? And I'm going to use my own data for the cone nebula which I somehow managed to get in January here in Eastern New York State on one of the coldest nights where I've ever imaged in my life. Uh, let's start off by just listing some programs. Uh, GIMP, GNU Image Manipulation Program, is the open source Photoshop uh, competitor that I use. I'm using version 2.10.22. I'm a little out of date. Current version is 2.10.34. And any version 2.10 or higher should be 16-bit. I would not go with an old version of GIMP that does 8-bit processing because that will hurt certain features of your images. It's time to move on from 8-bit. Uh, plugins for GIMP are available, and there are probably more than what I have listed here. Uh, the first I'm going to discuss is the GIMP resynthesizer plugin. Uh, this is a bit of a cheat button. <laughs> if you've got an image, that's wonderful, except for that one dust moat in the middle of the nebula that did not calibrate out with your flats, and you just want to make it go away. Uh, this is kind of a heel selection uh, plugin. Uh, getting it installed on your computer is a little tricky, so there's some uh, there's some help online for how to install it. I've given you a link there. Uh, there are GIMP plugins by Georg Hennisch. And his website is here. I use one of them. It's the uh, star rounding plugin. I don't think I'm going to cover it in the tutorial tonight, but it really helps if you've got a nice image that has egg shaped stars in one corner, despite your best efforts to fix tilt and back focus. And Pi Astro for GIMP is another very popular one. It's a package. Uh, Pi Astro for GIMP, as I recall, is an attempt to get everything in one place. So you can do things like noise reduction, gradient removal, histogram balancing, uh, all in GIMP without exporting files. Um, I used it for a while. I found I could do things better outside of GIMP using certain accessory programs. So I don't have it installed right now, but a lot of people have actually really liked this package. So I thought I would put it up there. Besides GIMP, I have this lovely list of approximately 10 more programs that I use intermittently or frequently. Uh, so Fitz work by Jens Dierks. Uh, there's an English version and a German version. So if you like to process Alf Deutsch, you can get the uh, German version. 
And the English version is better for those of us uh, who speak American English like me. And Deep Sky Stacker is probably well known to everybody watching this. Uh, I use that one for stacking, especially live at the telescope when I want a quick preview. Sometimes for my final images, I'll stack in Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, Cyril also can do very nice calibration, registration, and stacking. If I have a really, really nice data set with many hundreds of subs, and I want to get the most out of it, I'm willing to go through the longer and more involved workflow in Cyril to get my stacks. I typically can get slightly better results, especially on the faint fuzzy stuff. Uh, Images Plus used to be pay software years ago by ML Unsold Digital Imaging. It's now available free of charge, and thanks very much to the developer for making that possible. Uh, Starnet Plus Plus version two is a free uh, program that's tremendously useful, and what it does is separates the stars from the nebulosity, galaxies, and sky background. I am going to use that in my workflow tonight. Truthfully, don't know how I survived before it existed. Um, especially as a user, user of a schmidt cassegrain telescope from time to time, where I have a lot of overexposed, burned-out stars, and I really don't want to stretch them too hard. Uh, this program, decoupling the stars and the, and the background, is just fantastic. Uh, Regim by Andreas Rerich um, is uh, on Andreas' website. And uh, I use this program especially when I have a problem registering my stacks to a common reference frame using Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, I also use Regim for gradient removal sometimes. It actually does an absolutely fantastic job, sometimes better than the other programs here. Uh, Astro Denoise Pi is a relatively new Python plugin, uh, or I should say an executable file that you can run uh, your entire completed image through. And uh, this one provides a very strong denoising effect. Its uh, denoising effect is somewhat similar to Topaz AI in that it may be too strong for certain people, uh, but it can be used to great effect if you have a good workflow for it. And I think I will show some of that tonight. AstroSharp is an AI sharpening program. Um, I tend not to use AI sharpening on any of my images. I tend to go with uh, standard sharpening, uh, either deconvolution or something akin to wavelet sharpening. Sharpening, and I just try to avoid the whole AI sharpening issue, the fake details issue. But I will admit I'm not opposed to using AI noise removal, and I actually love Topaz AI for its noise removal feature. And I turn the sharpening completely off, so I don't have to think about it. Uh, Graxpert, I believe, was the subject of a recent Astro Imaging Channel presentation. It's a gradient removal tool. Uh, I just downloaded it a few days ago after hearing about it last week on this channel. It looks wonderful. I think this program is fantastic. And uh, I'm not going to do too much with gradient removal tonight, but uh, I would encourage you to give it a shot. And Irfan View is uh, a very uh, true and tested piece of software that's 8-bit, which I use for quick scanning through TIFF files. I don't process anything in it really, but I do use it to scan through a bunch of TIFF files and look for something in my workflow. And I'll probably get caught doing that several times tonight because it's just very fast. Uh, there are other free programs and plugins available. I've probably missed a few that people really enjoy using that, are, that can do some fantastic things. And uh, this isn't meant to exclude anybody. And I hope I've given credit to as many of the developers as possible here. Uh, it's their generosity in sharing their hard work and the software they've developed uh, with the Astro Imaging community is uh, appreciated beyond belief. All right, so uh, with that list of programs to work from, uh, I'm going to give what might be the most important slide in my presentation tonight, which is just getting files in and out of GIMP. Uh, this is the single biggest headache you'll face if you're going to use a workflow like mine. If you don't want to do everything in GIMP and you want to use 12 programs besides GIMP like I do, uh, you're going to have to get TIFF files out of GIMP and you're going to have to get TIFF files or FITS files back into GIMP. And if software doesn't want to open files 
generated in other softwares, you will have endless headaches. And I've developed uh, an approach in GIMP that allows me to open mono and RGB FITS files without any problems and export TIFF files that can be opened in all of the programs in the previous list I showed you. Uh, if you don't follow my suggestions, uh, you're going to run into some difficulties. Uh, so I would suggest uh, studying the slide carefully if you're just starting to use GIMP. Um, so opening a mono fits file and stretching it is fairly straightforward. I'll demonstrate that momentarily. We're going to get this little menu here. And when we say image composing, we're actually going to check the box that says none for a grayscale uh, fits file. Opening an RGB fits file in GIMP, a lot of people have been tripped up by this step in the past. If you don't check this box that says N axis, et cetera, uh, it will open up three grayscale images. It'll split it into channels in three different windows. And it's surprising and very annoying that it does that. But as long as you check the N axis option, it will open your RGB fits file as an RGB file and you can manipulate it. Uh, and most importantly, exporting a TIFF file that other programs can use. Uh, I stick with 16-bit integer, all right? So if you open up your FITS file and it says 32-bit floating point, which it probably will, uh, you're going to want to stretch it first and then immediately switch to 16-bit integer. And when it gives you the little pop-up box that says perceptual gamma, gamma or linear light, go with perceptual gamma. Uh, these settings, 16-bit integer and perceptual gamma, gamma sRGB, always generate TIFF files that other programs can open. And I don't think there's any need to try processing 32-bit files because GIMP is a 16-bit program, and it's probably not going to do anything. <laughs> so uh, the other thing you need to know is when you're combining layers to make a final image, before you export a TIFF file, you're going to want to right-click on it and get rid of this thing called an alpha channel. Do not leave any alpha channels in your TIFF files before you export them from GIMP. It causes a problem in virtually every other program that tries to open it. It just doesn't work. Uh, all kinds of awful things happen. If, if it can even open the file, it will change the stretch, and it'll be overstretched or understretched, just a nightmare. So no alpha channels allowed for the rest of this presentation. Uh, so I'm going to do a complete workflow on a now familiar data set. And what I'm going to uh, try to illustrate here is how to start from raw grayscale FITS files and do an LRGB composition in GIMP, and then add H alpha data. And this is Terry's NGC55 data set. And you can see there's these nice little pink emissions in here that are from the H alpha filter. How do you add that to an LRGB image in GIMP? Uh, so I think I posted a preview uh, last week that went up on YouTube. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is that was pushed way for, too far to the blue. This one looks color balanced a lot better. And my preview was also upside down and backwards. One of the first things you're going to learn with GIMP is it likes to flip FITS files vertically so that you have a mirror image. And it catches me again and again and again, and I just never learn. So hopefully you'll figure it out early on to check the orientation and the uh, sense of your image. So what we're, we're hoping for is that these three bright stars here are on the upper left, and these two stars are pointing like that. We don't have a, a mirror image of this galaxy. All right, so uh, uh, first slide is just going to summarize what I'm going to do. We're going to start off by taking the raw FITS files, which are mono data, and we're going to compose an RGB image in FITS work. So we'll start outside of GIMP. And then I'm going to do GIMP LRGB composition using that FITS file. And I'm going to teach you about something called LCH color mode in GIMP, which is one of my favorite tools. Uh, we're going to adjust the stretch and the saturation Dealing with chrominance noise in the dark parts. I think a lot of people will like that part of my presentation. Chrominance noise is those little colored speckles in the sky background. And no matter what you do with your noise reduction software, you can't get rid of them. 
but they just make bigger and bigger colored blotches in the background. And we've all seen images on Astrobin and elsewhere that have a blotchy green and blue background or something like that. I'm gonna show you a trick with GIMP to minimize that problem. Uh, the remove green noise function in Ciro, I absolutely love this thing. Uh, merge down and remove alpha channel and export TIFF and then maybe remove a gradient. Okay, so I'm gonna go right into GIMP right now. Um, I'm gonna show the uh, desktop layout and then I'm gonna switch over to FITS work because I have to make a FITS file that I wanna open. Uh, setting up your GIMP to look just like mine is not necessary. I don't even remember what the default interface looks like, but what I will tell you you've got to have is um, let me just open an image here. Uh, so we'll just open this file up. Uh, what you've absolutely got to have is this histogram. So this can show us uh, something about the uh, the stretch levels in the image, and we can also switch over to RGB and see if the colors are balanced or if something is awry. You've got to have that. You must have the layers dialog. Uh, without the layers, I don't know why you would even use this program. The whole point of this is to process in layers and to do various manipulations in different layers. And if you're unfamiliar with that kind of workflow, uh, after you go through a few images in GIMP, it'll start to seem comfortable. And I have the uh, tools and tool options over here in my version. I'm going to use this paintbrush tool an awful lot in processing this image, okay? So let me close this up for now. Let's say close view. First thing I'm gonna do is open up Fitzwork. And again, I've got the English version. And I'm just going to use Fitzwork for now to make an RGB composition. So I'll say file open, and I will go into the folder that contains the data. And what I'm looking for is red, green, and blue. I don't need luminance or H alpha right now. I'm gonna open those three files. They'll pop up in separate windows. I'm going to go to image combining next and say combine three black and white images to RGB image. There's also an option that tries to adjust the histogram for you, but I'd like to do that myself. So I'm just going to go with this. And it says which image for the red channel, how about red? Which image for the green channel, green? Blue channel, blue. Okay. And I've got an RGB composition just like that. And I believe Fitzwork uh, applies an auto stretch so that you can see what's going on. Uh, I think it's going to look darker than this when we open it up in the GIMP. Uh, my first reaction to this particular data set is, wow, must have some nice data here because when I do this at home with my uh, Bortle 4 or 5 light pollution, it's usually green. Like the whole entire image is green. And you shouldn't freak out if that happens, or it's pink, or purple, or blue. We're going to adjust the histogram and get rid of any imbalance between your color channels. But this one looks good right at the outset. So I'll say File, Save As. And it's going to, by default, name it RGB new 2fit And 32-bit floating point is fine. I'll leave it as the default for now. And um, I've named it. Um, number two here in my uh, workflow. I use square bracketed numbers to kind of label the steps. So if you just go ahead and save that, you'll get the file that's right there, okay? So GIMP can also composite images this way. You can open your FITS files in GIMP as layers and you can go through the workflow and just compose an RGB image and it's already in GIMP. However, I find the FITS work uh, workflow to be very convenient and quick and it's never failed me before i just keep using it so i really love this program it does many other interesting things by the way you can go on here and some of these background flattened uh, options are really interesting uh, they can do some strange things that i have not been able to do in other software there's various uh, pixel arithmetics and other things in here that you can use but for tonight i'm just using it to make the rgb fits file okay so back to GIMP, um, I'm actually gonna start with the luminance stack and then I'm gonna open that RGB fits file and stretch both of them. So we're gonna say file open in GIMP and I'm going to go into uh, my folder, folder contains the data. 
The best thing you can do here is click show all files. A lot of times it won't show FITS files. GIMP is perfectly capable of importing FITS files, but it sometimes doesn't want to. So you say show all files and you select uh, loom.fit and it's gonna open that up. And this pop-up menu, don't do the n-axis thing, it's not an RGB file. So just open it up with no composing. There it is, and it's really, really dark. Uh, often your FITS files will be really dark without any um, uh, auto stretch applied to it. Um, I can already tell GIMP flipped this vertically. I'm gonna have a mirror image. Here's the three bright stars I was looking at. They're down the bottom. These two stars that should be up here. Uh, if you want, you can flip it vertically right now, but I'm actually going to do some stretching first, and then we'll flip it. Uh, so the basic stretch workflow in GIMP goes like this. We're going to say uh, colors, levels. And it's a little bit tedious, but I'll tell you, I have gotten better results stretching with levels in GIMP than I have in Deep Sky Stacker with many years of trying in Deep Sky Stacker. So I do not stretch my stacks in Deep Sky Stacker. I do register and stack in there and I export them to FITS files, but I don't export them to TIFFs and open them in GIMP because I can do better in GIMP stretching it here. Um, another stretching program you might like is NASA FITS Liberator. That wasn't on my list, but it's been popular for many years that can stretch something really quickly and turn it into a TIFF. Maybe you would rather do that. You can get fantastic results with Fitz Liberator as well. Uh, so to do it in GIMP, we're going to actually grab this middle slider and the levels, and I'm gonna pull it down here. And you'll see that I've started to get a brighter image and the sky background's gone way up as well. Uh, what you wanna do is stretch this uh, far enough that you're somewhat in the range where you can see what's going on. And you don't want to get carried away just yet. Uh, but I do like to stretch it first before I convert it over to 16-bit. I'm a little bit sketchy about what happens if you convert it to 16-bit while it's black. I'm worried about losing some bit depth or uh, some dynamic range or something like that. Uh, I don't really know what it would do. So I tend to stretch it first and then convert it over to 16 bit. Uh, so I'll say okay on that. And we're just gonna kind of iterate with the levels. So colors, levels. I'm going to grab this left slider and make the sky background darker. But you don't wanna get too close to that peak. If you start clipping the peak, you're going to lose data on the dark end of the image. You really don't wanna do that. Um, I wanna stretch again though. So I'm gonna grab the middle slider make this a bit brighter and uh, okay. And I'll do levels one more time. So I'll just darken up the sky background a bit and not get too close to that peak. That's fine. All right, so now at this point, I'm ready to go and find out what kind of image GIMP thinks this is before I go any further. I'm gonna go over to image precision and sure enough, it thinks it's 32-bit floating point and linear light. I did not have much luck exporting images processed in this mode. All kinds of terrible things happened in other programs. So I'm immediately going to switch over to 16-bit integer. And when it asks me whether I want perceptual gamma or linear light, I'm going to say perceptual gamma. Convert it. And that's it. And when I did that, you'll notice the histogram took a jump to the right and it's a little bit easier to see what's going on with the left edge of this peak, which is important because this is where you're going to want to darken the sky background and kind of clip it down here somewhere. Uh, so that's good. You'll also see uh, if this button up here on the histogram says we're showing the values in perceptual space. I find it very annoying when the, the histogram is in linear space. The histogram tends to be way down here and you can't see what's going on. So I just do the perceptual gamma. All right, so uh, we're halfway there to having a luminance file that we could work with. Uh, but it is flipped vertically. It's not rotated, it's literally a mirror image. And GIMP tends to do that. You just have to get used to it and always check the 
whether your image is a mirror image by looking maybe at some professional data, for example. So I'm going to say image transform flip vertically. Uh, if you're working with layers, you can also do layer transform flip vertically. And if you don't do that, it'll flip all the layers with image transform. So it's better to use layer transform if you just want to flip one layer. Uh, so I'm pretty sure this image is right side up and not a mirror image at that point. Uh, so I might want to darken the sky background a little here. Uh, I'm just going to go here and darken it up a touch and say, OK. So that gets me a kind of working copy of the luminance channel. It's not going to be the final stretch. It's probably not bright enough, but I like it that way. So if I zoom in, it hasn't gotten to the point where I've blown out the cores of all the stars. And that's what you want to avoid doing is stretching so much that you've nuked the stars. Uh, so a kind of modest stretch that's down here somewhere in the histogram and isn't too risky is advised because later in the workflow, we can stretch the galaxy to be brighter without affecting the stars. So we just want to keep it conservative for now. So at this point, what well, I would Can I do... ask you a question before you sure. move on? Yeah. Uh, does GIMP have any nonlinear stretching algorithms? Absolutely. The curves feature. So if we go here to color and curves, uh, we can do anything arbitrary that we want here. So you make these S curves and you can stretch it like crazy here if you want. Uh, so that's a kind of manual thing. If you really wanna do an A, a sign H stretch or something of that nature, which is very popular these days, you could always do that in Fitz Liberator and just import it into GIMP. There's no reason why you can't. Uh, the Pi Astro plugin may have some of those stretches that people like, like a log square root and a sine h. Uh, it may have some of those in it, if I remember, but I don't have it installed right now. Uh, I tend to stretch manually, though. I've just done so well with this iterative level stretch. And where it really, it really does well is in the faint stuff. If you zoom in on the noise, uh, when I, with the stretch and deep sky stacker, I sometimes got posterization and other terrible things. If I stretched the faint stuff too hard, that's not going to happen with the levels. It's very safe, and it keeps the integrity of your data. Uh, so at this stage, we would export to a TIFF file. Rod, before we go on with what sure. we're asking the questions, we've interrupted you. Um, the list that you had earlier of all those wonderful programs that you've used um, you're using them with gimp being your basic workhorse and adding them to your gimp process but those files those programs can be used with a lot of different image processing programs correct you just have to That's be able correct. to yeah so what you're going to talk about what these things what you talked about what these things can do for you can be done with whatever you're using to do the major processing. That's correct. And okay. a good example of that is Cyril. I mean, you could probably do the entire workflow in Cyril. I'm not an expert in using Cyril, but there are certain things Cyril does that I really, really like. So I sometimes export a TIFF file from GIMP, do something in Cyril, and then come back to my home base, which is GIMP. Okay. And that's just the way that I work. But uh, it's absolutely not a knock on any of the other programs. Some of them are immensely capable. And I, I've only scratched the surface with what Cyril can do, for example. Um, so going back to the export here, we want a TIFF file. We'll say um, export as. And I, like I said, I number the steps in my workflow so I can go back and correct mistakes. Or if I came up with a magic workflow that I want to save forever, it's all here numbered. So I'll call it loom levels stretch .tiff, and I'm going to export that. And uh, what I didn't do was check if it has an alpha channel. And it won't at this point, but what you do is go over to the layers and right click on it. And if it says add alpha channel, please don't. Uh, if it says remove alpha channel, please do. We're just not going to deal with alpha channels, okay? So, Rather than uh, exporting over what's saved to my computer, I'm just going to close this because I have it just the way that I want on my hard drive. 
Uh, so the next step would be to open the RGB fits file that I composed over in fits work and start stretching it. So I'm gonna go find that. And I, I could say show all files, but it's here. I called that number two, RGB new two that fit. I'm gonna open it and don't forget the N axis button. So you don't want to leave this as none. You say N axis and open. And it will open the RGB fits file as a single image that's already composed. If I should go over here to image and mode, it'll say RGB. And that's just a nice sanity check. Uh, one of the things that's not very fun is if I left the luminance image open and I was working in grayscale, one, if I try to open an RGB image into that project, it'll convert it to grayscale. <laughs> so you won't be too happy with that. So you gotta be working in RGB mode before you open something in RGB mode. And with this, I'll just do a similar workflow with level stretching. And I'm sorry, it's a little tedious, but like I said, the results are good. So we'll do a couple iterations of this. And I have not converted it to 16 bit yet. But I'm going to just brighten it up so I can see what's going on. That is looking a little bit green, isn't it? Starting to look like my data. All right, I suspect we're in linear light because I see this highlighted. Show values in linear space. Okay. That's good enough. So before I look at the histogram in more detail, I am going to go over here. I hope I didn't clip that too much and say image precision, sure enough, 32-bit floating point and linear light. I'll go to 16-bit and perceptual gamma again and convert. When I do that, the histogram kind of pops out into the middle. What I can do now is switch over to RGB mode. And what I will find out in a hurry is that the sky background was highest with the green second highest with the red, and lowest with the blue. And that has something to do with your sublength, your light pollution, and maybe your camera sensor and how sensitive it is to each wavelength. Uh, I like to uh, balance my histograms manually. Uh, this is a giant can of worms. Some people want to use photometric color calibration these days and try to use the stars in the image that are known spectral types to get a so-called true color image. Um, if you have outstanding quality data, go for it. I've not had that much luck with it though, so I'm not going to do that tonight. What I would like to do is get this histogram a little bit closer to balance so I don't have a greenish sky. I'm gonna do that by going to levels, choosing the green channel, and I'm going to clip the background of the green channel until it's about on top of the blue. I'm not going to do it perfectly because this still needs to be stretched a bit. Now the red channel, I'll switch over there. And I'm going to clip the background of the red channel until it's approximately on top of the other two. Good enough. Now I have a gray looking background, which is nice. Notice I did not let the left edge of this peak get too close to the black point over here. We really don't want to clip any information off here because that could leave cold pixels in the sky background and make a mess out of the image. So I'm going to do a little bit more level stretching now before we take another look at the histogram. That's probably bright enough. Okay. And what I'm seeing here is maybe the blue channel got stretched a little bit more than the red and the green. And that might have something to do with the fact that the sky background was lower. When I applied the levels to the whole thing, I actually applied a stronger stretch to the blue. Uh, looking at this image, it, it's kind of looking like the whole thing is gonna have a blue tint. I haven't really pumped up the color saturation yet, but I'm gonna to try to actually unstretch the blue channel a little bit to match the other two. I'm gonna do that also with levels. Uh, this is a little bit tricky. It's a judgment call and takes some practice, but I want to unstretch the blue channel 
I'll go down to something like that. And then take the output levels and we'll see how close I can get here. Looking for about the same width as the other two colors. That isn't bad. All right, so the blue peak kind of disappeared between the other two, and I don't think it's much narrower. So I'm going to do one last levels adjustment to kind of darken the sky background a bit. And now what we can do is uh, we can just increase the saturation a bit to see where we are. So we'll go to colors, uh, hue and saturation. I actually don't use this menu that just says GIMP saturation. I'm not quite sure how that works. Uh, hue and saturation is good enough. Um, I will mention while I'm in here that increasing the saturation in GIMP works nicely to bring out the colors, but it's not exactly reversible. So if you oversaturate your image and you feel bad about it later on, you try to decrease the saturation, I find that it doesn't quite go back to where it should be. So I would avoid oversaturating it. So applying a saturation until the colors make your eyes bleed at the stage is not advised. So we'll just do 100% saturation once. At that point, this is not looking so bad, except for the fact that it's flipped vertically again. So we've got three stars here, and I made a mental note that they should be up here. So I'm going to say image, transform, flip vertically. All right, so that should line up with the luminance channel now. Um, I've given enough color saturation at this point to show something that's going to vex you in your image processing throughout your career. And I think that um, pretty much everyone has encountered this problem, especially with galaxies. Take a good look at this image. The color noise or chrominance noise in the bright part of the image doesn't seem to be bad at all. Looks like a kind of off-white color here, some blue, maybe a pink dot there, some blue. But as I get closer and closer to sky background, I get into this absolutely hideous chrominance noise, all these little colored speckles. I'll blow that up even more so you can see it. Red, green, and blue dots all over the place. And what that's saying is the way we've stretched this was kind of inappropriate. The signal to noise here in the sky background is not high enough to support that amount of stretching, and we've gone too far. And the temptation with beginners is to take this image and throw it right into their noise reduction software. And I'm sure I did that 100 times my first few years imaging. What invariably happens is that all those little colored dots become bigger smoother color dots and you have a blotchy green background we don't want that so i will show you how to get out of that bind uh, with this next little trick so we've got the um rgb layer in there and we're working in rgb mode and actually i should export this right now because i want to save a copy of it so i should say export as uh and this is going to be my RGB level stretch. I would export it right there. Okay. And uh, just double check there's no alpha channel. We're good. Uh, I think we can work with this copy for now, though. So, what I'm actually going to do is open the luminance now as layers. So, we have this luminance level stretch from before. I'm going to open that in RGB mode. There's the luminance. Now, there's two ways you can combine the RGB data with the luminance. Uh, the way that I do it is LCH color mode. Then somebody pointed out to me on cloudy nights, why don't you just use the luminance mode for the luminance channel? <laughs> and I said, use the what? I never realized it was in there. So I think you could do it this way. Yep, there's luminance there. And when you do that, it'll make this the luminance and add the RGB in the bottom layer. <laughs> Isn't that convenient? I think I only went about eight years and never noticed that. Uh, the way I'm going to go back to normal mode here. The way I've always done it, and I'm going to do it tonight because I know it works, is to put the luminance on the bottom. Okay, so I've got the color on the top. And instead of working in normal mode, I'm going to go to LCH color mode. 
And this basically accomplishes the same thing, all right? So if I zoom in here, I can still see all that nasty chrominance noise. And this is where you have to develop a little bit of skill in adjusting histograms. Uh, take some practice, but I'll give you some pointers if you're new to GIMP, that'll get you started. Uh, so I want this colored speckling to go away. And furthermore, the color over here is kind of weak. I would like to see nicer color saturation and contrast in here. So I'm gonna try to accomplish both things in this color LCH mode. So we'll go with this layer highlighted, the RGB layer hired, highlighted, not the luminance. I will go to colors and curves. And I'm gonna get a new histogram pop up. And we're gonna work with this histogram. First thing I'm gonna to wanna to do is say, where am I in the histogram when I'm looking at all the awful color noise? And you can find out by clicking on the image. And it's gonna tell me, hey, that peak is the sky background. So most of the pixels in this image are sky background pixels. It's an isolated galaxy. So the peak is going to be the sky background. The pixels corresponding to the brighter parts of the galaxy are up here somewhere. And the cores of the stars are probably all the way up here. So right around this peak is where we're going to have to manipulate things to get the sky background to look the way that it wants. And you can click around in here in the sky background, just get an idea of the region of the histogram you want to manipulate. And it's very clear that it's right in that peak. So what I'm gonna do is in the color LCH mode, I'm gonna flatten out the curve. This line here, which is temporarily linear, is the curve. I'm gonna flatten it out where I want to unstretch the color information. So I would say the color data is stretched too strongly here. I'm gonna back off the stretch. And the way that we do that is by pinning down the curve right there. I'll put a little anchor point and then watch the little colored speckles here as I flatten this out. There they go. So that is a super useful trick. I don't have to feed this image to noise reduction already to try to get rid of colored speckles. They're gone. I mean, they're still there. I've just unstretched them so much you can barely tell. Um, so the, I guess the next step is to figure out where the, the meat of the galaxy is in the histogram. Looks like we're in the middle somewhere. So these are our midtones. And I want a stronger stretch of the color information there. So I'm going to make the curve steeper instead of shallower. And I'm going to grab the curve up here somewhere. And as I do that, I'm gonna get stronger and stronger color in the galaxy. So I usually spend quite a bit of time on this step and zoom in and really critically look at what I did. Let's do that. Um, maybe actually went even a little too far up the galaxy, but that's okay. Um, I'm seeing a little too much color noise kind of in the margins of the galaxy. And it's not bad out here in the sky background. Uh, but I think that I actually want to flatten it out a little further and try to lower some of the color noise here. Let's just zoom out and see how that looks. Not bad. Got a gray sky background. I've got nice colors in the galaxy. And I think I'm ready to save this and say it's okay. So that will give you a mechanism to combine the luminance and the RGB and not worry about ugly color noise in the sky background. One other thing you can do, if your data set is not as nice as this one, and most of mine are not, you zoom in and look at stars, for example, uh, and you look at the star and it's got colored speckles on it. So it's supposed to be an orange star in this case, but you see some green and blue dots in there. One of the things you can do that won't hurt you that badly is put a Gaussian blur on the color layer. It won't hurt the sharpness of your luminance, 
to blur the color out a little bit. And your eyes basically can't tell as long as the blur isn't severe. So you go to filters, blur, Gaussian blur. The default is one and a half pixels. Uh, you could turn that down to half a pixel or one pixel, something like that. Uh, it'll blur out any little tiny colored speckles that you can see in the brighter regions. I'm not going to do it to this image. It absolutely does not need it. Okay. So at that point, I'm going to look the image over for problems. And, oh, hey, what's that? <laughs> I've got a, a lucky four-leaf clover that's supposed to be a star. So green stars are one of the scourges of my imaging projects. Uh, here and there, I get a star like this. And maybe it's something in my processing, but usually it's a bright star that got overexposed while I was collecting the data. So the star was saturated, and it was more saturated in one of the color channels than it was in the other two. And I get a two-tone star like this, and it's usually it's got a green center. And nobody wants to see green stars, so we're going to have to do something about that. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, for the time being, say I want to export this so that I can work on it in another program. So what I'll do is say layer, merge down. And I've got the color layer on top highlighted. When I do that, I'll get a single image. And it looks like it's ready to export. But if I right click on it, I see remove alpha channel. Don't forget that. So I'm going to remove the transparency information. Now it's ready to export. Okay, so I will go file export as, and I think I just called this one lchcolor.tiff, okay? So I'm gonna close this one up. And I'm going to use Cyril. Before you do this step, you wanna make sure that your histogram is reasonably well balanced. You shouldn't have problems with your levels or a green sky background or a severely nonlinear stretch that's caused some kind of problem. You want the histogram fairly well balanced. I'm going to go ahead and open up that file that was called LCH color in Ciro. It's going to open up looking black and white. Probably my favorite function in all of Ciro is image processing. Remove green noise. Uh, it will remove actual green chrominance noise in the background and it will remove green star centers. What it does is to replace any obviously green pixels with either kind of adjacent pixels, which are usually white, blue, yellow, orange. So it kind of just interpolates with neighboring pixels. I'm just gonna use the default. I've really never needed to deviate from it. Just say apply, it takes a second to run. Close. Uh, come over here to the save dialog, and I will save that as uh, RGN for remove, remove green noise, serial.tiff. I would save it right there. Okay. Back to GIMP. I now want to see if it was successful. Every once in a while, I run remove green noise, and it does something bad that I really don't like. One of the things that can happen is... If you are processing a narrow band image and it actually has some green in it, remove green noise is not going to help you that much because it's going to remove all the green. So maybe you don't want to try that with a narrow band image that's supposed to have green in it if you're doing SHO or something like that. What I'm going to do here is check my image and see if it did what I wanted. So I take RGN and the original version and open them as layers. Uh, it asks me to convert the serial image to GIMP built-in sRGB. I'm going to do that. So let me put remove green noise on the bottom. Two minutes, see if I can find that offending green star again. There it is. Looks like one of my stars from the C11. All right. So I'm just going to toggle the visibility and see how we did on this. Really nice. 
I don't see any green at all. The center of the star is white. Okay. That star looks like it was overexposed. Uh, what can you really do? So better than having a green flare around the middle. And if I go around and zoom out a little bit, I can look, look for problems generally and do a little bit of toggling. I can see this star here had something happen. I had some ugly green pixels around it. Now they're, they've been converted to light blue. So I find that function to be wonderful. And if you have green speckles in your background, even after kind of removing the chrominance noise by unstretching it the way I showed you, remove green noise will get rid of the green speckles in the background. Those of us with short imaging time and who do not have deep stacks of data are more likely to have a lot of green noise in the background. And it's going to be substantially uglier than this image. Uh, if you have light pollution, often get a gradient in the green channel. Removing that gradient leads to noise in the green channel. So the remove green noise function, if used judiciously, can be of tremendous value to get rid of unnatural green, especially in the sky background. All right, I'm pretty happy with the way that went. So uh, I'm actually going to delete this. Uh, remove green noise is the new sheriff in town. I'm going to work with that file. And next thing I want to do is deal with the fact that I'd like to process the stars and the galaxy separately from this point on. Maybe the core of that galaxy could be a little bit brighter. And there are a lot of cases where... I've got a galaxy where you can barely see the color, but the stars are already oversaturated. And depending on your filter set and how you exposed it and everything, that can be a big problem. You just bump the saturation a little bit and your kind of orange or yellow stars are just blazing orange and you've pushed the saturation to the limit. They already look terrible. You say, hey, I can't increase the saturation on this image without killing the stars. So what's my best move? I wish I could only process the galaxy and increase the saturation there. And we're going to go to Starnet++ to do that. So we will go onto my computer and try to find uh, Starnet++. We've got um, the GUI version here. Open it up. Get this little dialog. I'm going to browse uh, into that folder. Uh, I would like to have uh, remove green noise as my starting image. Okay. And I'm going to name it number six starless.tiff. So I'll open that up and six uh, starless.tiff. At that point, you'll press run. I'm not going to run Starnet right now because sets my computer on fire, never mind while I'm live streaming. And I already did it beforehand. If you press run and Starnet won't process your TIFF file, and it tells you, hey, 16-bit TIFF files only, chances are you forgot to convert to 16-bit integer or you left the alpha channel in there. Uh, Starnet is going to kick out A starless image, I'm going to use Irfan view here just to look at it really quickly. It did a wonderful job on this image. Uh, I usually don't get results this good. I have a few stars I couldn't remove, and it subtracts out my background galaxies and everything. But it did a great job on this. And for the first time, we noticed that we have a little bit of a processing glitch. We've got these two rays coming into the image on the lower left. Usually those reflections are due to a bright star that's sitting right outside the field of view. And it just barely got inside your imaging train and reflected off something like a dew shield or some optical element. And it put these lovely rays right into your image. These are not too bad. Uh, we can deal with them. One of my imaging projects uh, last summer or the year before was utterly destroyed by reflections like this, by one lousy star outside the field of view. I could not rescue it. I had a trip to a Bortle II dark site, wonderful dark site. I imaged all night, and I didn't bother to look at the data because I was on battery power. 
I didn't want to run my batteries down. When I got home, I found a couple of rays like this that went right through the entire image. It was a total waste of a dark side trip. And I only get one or two of those every year. A total pain and suffering. But we can deal with it in this one. So uh, the first thing to do is open that starless image in GIP. So we're going to say open as layers. Go to starless. And when I first used Starnet++, I was overjoyed to have that software, neural network software available. And thanks so much to the developer for sharing it with the community. It's just fantastic. But what I wanted to do, obviously, is subtract one image from the other and get an image that only has the stars in it. So using my sense of mathematics, I put the original image in the top layer and set it to subtract mode. If I can find that, it's in here somewhere. Subtract. Uh-oh, <laughs> that didn't go too well. Uh, sometimes it actually gives you the stars, but I'm telling you right now, the math is not right. So don't do that. Go back to normal. Put the starless image on top and go to subtract mode. There's your stars. Why GIMP works that way is anybody's guess, but this is the way to do it. So just trust me. <laughs> so we've got the stars by themselves. Um, Starnet sometimes will pick out a lot of little details from a galaxy like this that it thinks are stars. Um, I've learned over many iterations not to mess with that. Uh, just do the subtraction and don't mess with the stars image. Uh, if you apply some sharpening to the stars or size reduction, uh, it is going to sharpen those details in the galaxy. I think you just have to live with it. Uh, so anyway, I want to get the stars image. So we're going to do layer and merge down, remove alpha channel, and file export. I'm going to go as stars only. So I would export it as step seven in my workflow. All right, so I'm not going to do that. The next step is if I zoom in on the stars only, I can see that, believe it or not, Terry did not have perfect seeing and perfect optics when he took the data. And the stars actually are a little bit blurry, especially the fainter ones. If you look at these stars, I wish I could tighten those up a little bit. Maybe not too much, just a little bit. And I'm going to do that in Images Plus. So let me open that software. Say File Open, Stars Only. And I'll zoom way in on it this time just so you can see what's going on. Get a few of these stars. Uh, this is a very quick workflow to go to um, special functions, star size, shape, and halo reduction. I love this feature. It's very powerful. In fact, it's too powerful. You barely need to pull the sliders. Uh, you could play around with the dialogue here and some of the blend and fade options. But for now, let's just take the red, green, and blue and pull them all to the very first tick. So it says 0 0.608 on the right. Watch those fainter stars when I let go of this. There they go. Instantaneous reduction in size. And as long as you're not overzealous with it, it works wonderfully. It will not fix a star that has a burned out core. You are not going to get rid of this white circle on that star. It will fix the faint to intermediate stars that are a little bit fuzzy because your seeing wasn't great or your guiding or whatever. Okay, so I'll say apply and done. I'm going to export that. And it will go into uh, star size reduction 0.6.tiff. Okay. So that, that will tighten up the stars a bit there. I'm going to shelf that image for a minute. The next thing I want to deal with, I'm actually going to close this, in fact. Next thing I want to deal with is those rays. File open. Let's go in the starless image. 
Now, it's nice to do this step in the starless image because I'm going to use the GIMP resynthesizer. So this is a bit of a cheat tool. Uh, I don't want a lot of stars hanging around when I use this tool. It will clone some of the stars and it will generate fake stars in the image. So if I'm going to remove a blemish like this, and more often than not, it's a dust mode or a black circle on the image because your flats weren't quite right. Uh, but in this case, it's a couple of rays in the lower left corner. Uh, I like to work with the starless image if I can. So the way this works is we'll go to filters. Uh, not yet. I'm jump, jumping the gun. Uh, I need a selection first. So I'll get this uh, free select tool. And I'm going to select the offending blemish. And I'm going to give it a rather generous berth around it. And I am actually going to heal away those background galaxies, which is not going to hurt anything with this workflow. And I'll show you why momentarily. Now, I want to get the whole corner here. I'm going to go outside the bounds of the image. It allows you to do that. Back here and join it. Now I've got a selection. Okay. Filters. Um, enhance heal selection. This is the resynthesizer plugin, and I'll take the default of 50 pixels. Now, the resynthesizer is not a magic bullet. It can crash if your selection is too small, and you have to exit GIMP and restart. So if you take a tiny selection, you're going to get in trouble. It can also crash or get hung up if your selection is too big. And this one's dangerously big, but I'm going to throw caution to the wind. So it's going to take all the pixels outside here. And what it does is basically extrapolate those pixels into the selection and replace everything inside that lasso. So it's guessing what should be inside the lasso. It's not really artificial intelligence. It's more of an extrapolation routine. Uh, so if you have stars out here, it's going to put stars in the lasso. That's why you want to use the starless image. Looks like it's not going to crash. Okay. Oh, there we go. Select none. Rays gone. Uh, so are the background galaxies, though. Uh, that looks like fairly natural sky background. I can't tell there was anything there at all. Okay. So next thing to do is don't just keep this as the starless image. We're going to open the starless image again. So number six starless comes up. What we're going to do is we're going to apply a layer mask. So right click, add layer mask, white. And what I'm going to do is put some black on this layer mask so that it lets the bottom layer come through where the problem is located. I will grab this paintbrush tool, this fuzzy little sphere here. I've got the opacity at 100%. And size, I want a little bigger than that. Oh, that's too big. All right, so highlight the layer mask. We want to be have that selected. And I'm going to go like this on the layer mask. In fact, you can drag it around a bit. And as I do that, I'm not going to touch those background galaxies to the best of my ability. Okay, and this may take a little bit of skill. But there we go. So Starless Image uh, healed the, the blemish that we know is an artifact. Highlight the top layer. Uh, layer merge down. Right click. Remove alpha channel. And I'm going to export that to... Uh, starless heel selection okay so that would be where it goes in my workflow so the next step is to recombine the stars and the starless image that's been healed uh, we need um, stars only with star size reduction and starless heel selection open these guys up and this is the part uh, we set to addition mode first. This is the part where you can independently manipulate the galaxy and the stars. So 
Maybe the sky background is a little bright. I could do a levels adjustment there. A little bit close to clipping that, but okay. Uh, at this point, am I happy with the saturation on the Galaxy? Probably. But if you're not, you could bump it a little bit. Get a little bit more yellow in the core of the Galaxy. That would be fine. I'm not going to do it. Am I happy with the star saturation? Maybe, maybe not. So I could go to saturation there and say, I want to bump up the star colors. I'm not going to do that either, but you could. Am I happy with the intensity? All right, so here's where the judgment comes in. Do I want a brighter galaxy core? I want a nonlinear stretch at this point. Uh, let's say yes on that. It's a little bit dim in the core, and I want to stretch the galaxy without touching the stars. So let's bring up the curves dialog. And what I'm going to do is kind of stretch up the curves to get the core a little brighter. As I do that, everything else is going to get stretched out of proportion. That may be too much. And I'm going to grab it down here and bring it back to where it was. That will give me a nice gentle S-shaped curve and keep the sky background right about where it was. So let's say that's bright enough for our tastes. And I don't want to do anything to the stars. So I've stretched up the galaxy, got it as bright as I want in the final image, darkened the sky background, and I've got the um, stars right where I want them. So we're almost done with the LRGB. Unless you want to do more cosmetic adjustments at this point, it's time to say layer, merge down, and remove alpha channel. And we'll export this to, uh, actually, we're not going to do that yet. Uh, heal selection and recombine. So I've got the, the healed galaxy image, and I recombine them. And I can export it to that file. Okay. All right. So the last major step I want to demonstrate that I've got to get through is how to put the H alpha into the galaxy. Everybody wants to know how to do that. So I'll show you uh, how I work it. The problem with H alpha is that if we're doing <coughs> RHGB, we don't want to compose to an RGB image because there's only three channels. So we're composing to four channels, really, R, H, G, and B. So how do we deal with that in GIMP? And this is the workflow I use. So we'll take the image we just created and we'll say colors, components, decompose. And I'm going to decompose to an RGB. When I do that, GIMP is going to give me three grayscale images. And it's going to go back into red, green, and blue. And these are the red, green, and blue channels in the LRGB I just created. At that point, I can open up my H alpha data. And to save a little time, I've pre stretched it. I opened it in GIMP, did the level stretch. We'll open up that as layers. We'll say here's the H alpha. And I'm going to put that right under the red. Okay, so I've got R, H, G, and B. So what I'm going to do now is manually colorize all the layers, and I'm going to stretch the H alpha so that the highlights come through and recombine it. So we'll go to image, mode, RGB. So we're working in RGB mode. Go to the red channel, colors, colorize. Okay, so this is a little dialogue. Took me a while to figure out. I want to make red. I'm going to use, click this blue bar here. Click this second button here that says CMYK. And to get red, I'm going to turn magenta all the way up.
black is 50. There's the alpha. Uh, talks. I can see the uh, okay. Um, the the audio bar going. Yeah. Just to see. Okay. No processing H alpha. Okay. I think we might be back on. Uh, I'll oh, let you know. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, what we want to do is stretch pretty aggressively the H alpha until it comes poking through the red layer. And as I stretch the curves up. We should start to see some H alpha. This is tricky. It is not easy. Oh no, this is not working as well as it did with my previous version. All right, it's really actually not working at all. So the H alpha, you can start to see it poking through a little bit here. Uh, not very saturated. If you don't mind, I'm going to open my saved version here. Uh, if I have that somewhere. Let's go ahead and um, open it in another folder. All right, so did I save that somewhere? Well, now I've totally messed it up. All right, so uh, not doing so well here. It might be that I've made the uh, luminance stretch too much. Let's try it again. Uh, colors and curves. Let's see if I can get that H alpha to come through. Well, there's some of it. I've got, also got the sky background going crazy. But you're going to put a pretty aggressive stretch on the H alpha. And if I just zoom in a little bit and forget the sky background for a minute, you'll see the H alpha region start to poke through in the galaxy all right so i've done something not quite right so what i'm going to do is uh, close this i'm going to open my saved version I'm not sure what i did wrong there uh, 
but you're if you stretch that h alpha too aggressively you're going to have pink features all over the face of the galaxy now, if you don't stretch it enough uh you'll have tiny h alpha dots all right so uh when you are done uh manipulating the h alpha we have to we have to merge down all the layers that were in here um you'll start at the bottom with the green layer that was down here say merge down and work your way up and say merge down merge down merge down until you're left with one layer okay so this is the point that i'm supposed to be at uh, and you're going to want to remove the alpha channel again uh, so this technique will allow you to have h alpha peeking through only in the places where you made it brighter than the red channel and it's a bit of a judgment call but I've gotten great results on a lot of galaxy images this way. You can see even these little tiny H alpha regions out here uh, came out really well when I processed this beforehand. Uh, one of the things that can go wrong uh, composing the H alpha in this fashion is with some of my filter sets, the stars will start to turn pink. So some of the H alpha data may actually bleed through into the stars. So the problem, uh, that you have is you've got the H alpha where you want it in the galaxy, but you've got artifacts out here. It could be the sky background, like what was happening a few minutes ago, it turned red, or you could have stars that have turned pink and you don't want to keep that part of the image. So what we do is we open up the original LRGB image. So we'll go to, um, I think it was that one. All right, so that's the original LRGB. And this is what it looks like after I added the H alpha. You can kind of blink it on and off. I was quite happy with that result. I don't know why I couldn't just duplicate it. So what we'll do here is add that layer mask again, a white mask. And you can set the opacity of this layer a little bit lower so you can see where the H alpha is, or you can blink on and off, it's up to you. Go on the layer mask, and we will use uh, the paintbrush tool with uh, black as the primary color. And we can blink and see where there's more H alpha. And we will draw on the mask regions where we want the H alpha to, to peak through. All right, so you have to be diligent in, in hunting down the H alpha patches, but if you spend enough time, you'll find them all. And in this way, you're only adding H alpha where you want it in the image. You won't have a pink star over here that got H alpha added to it. Uh, so we could say layer merge down, remove alpha channel, and now we've got a galaxy that's had H alpha selectively added to it. Okay, so at this point i think we're about out of time right i mean we stop at 11. yeah you we probably are close to out of time there was a question sure are you familiar with uh continuum subtraction i'm not that familiar so marcia asked how does this compare to continuum subtraction oh i may not Red be channel. able to answer that one <laughs> well we we'll just leave that one hanging out there okay uh, Marcia, that may be something i learn about other than that, I know you probably wanted to do another image, but we kind of are out of time. Uh, we could schedule you in for another presentation if you'd like. Oh, sure. We could do that in six months or something when you need a presenter. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, is there yeah. anything more you want to say about the uh, NGC 55? Um, I was going to briefly go over deconvolution um, and noise reduction. You can do it in Images Plus. Maybe I'll just... It, spend 30 seconds on that um, 30 seconds I, is about right <laughs> you can open up uh here's a little test section uh images plus has a nice deconvolution routine you can play with it's going to go under smooth sharpen and uh, take this adaptive uh richard lucy restoration you'll have to play with the settings but i know some good ones for this image and you can sharpen some of the fine details this way and you can see some of the details pop a little better. Uh, didn't really need much deconvolution or noise reduction on this image. 
It was a very nice data set, and I thank Terry very much for sharing it with the community. Um, so with that, I guess I'll wrap up. All right, I'm back here. That was, my, right, well, that was my really answer. interesting, Ron. So well, thank you. Thank you for going through all of that. Uh, sorry, we ran out of time a little bit there, but it, it would be nice to uh, maybe have you come back because we could so we could see that other image that you wanted to process. But sure. you know, it's interesting to see this workflow, and and uh, I've not used GIMP, but I'm certainly familiar with PixInsight and with Photoshop, and you see essentially a lot of the same same uh, basic concepts just done in a slightly different way and uh... yeah i agree absolutely and some people may not like this kind of workflow exporting images all over the place and using 12 different programs a lot of people just want to keep it in one software package and do the whole thing if that's the case you should probably look into pix insight download the demo version and if you like it you roll with that uh, if you don't mind uh, using a lot of different accessory programs like I do, and you're too lazy to come up the learning curve of PixInsight, you might find yourself using GIMP for 10 more years. Right. Well, it certainly yeah. seems like you've figured out what, a way that works well for you. So, And I used to, uh, as I heard Jay Gabani, a, a reasonably well-known astrophotographer, say, at the beginning of all his presentations, is this is the way I do it. You may have a different way. So. I like that perspective a lot. I'll also add on to that that uh, you may not like my stretch levels. You may not like my color balance, especially with galaxies. How blue is too blue in the arms? Is it really true that as you'd be seeing yellow in the middle of the core when my data told me it wasn't that yellow? Uh, there are judgment calls that go in there, and some people like more saturation. Some people say the colors are oversaturated and my eyes are going to be burned out. Uh, there's personal preferences, <laughs> how small is too small at the stars, et cetera. Uh, but uh, yeah, to each his own, you process the data the way that you like it, especially if it's your data. And uh, as long as the software that you have can achieve what you want and you're not running into constant headaches, it'll work for you. Yeah, very well said on that. So, and you're you're right about the color, and I, I tend to get to that point too with with my images, where uh, you know once you're just trying to dial in the color exactly right, you a little bit here and tweak a little bit there, and you sometimes you just kind of have to say, okay, I think this is I think this is done. That's got to be my Achilles heel right from day one. My first ever image of M101, I posted on cloudy nights, and I got shot out of the sky as soon as they saw it. The core of galaxies is not supposed to be pink, says the person. Sorry, period. Well, you, you know, the mistake, <laughs> the mistake that you made, Ron, is you posted it on Cloudy Nights. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the resolution was so low with the 500K file size limit that people probably couldn't tell it was actually there. But the core of my M101 was, really was too pink. It was terrible because I just started to learn processing. So, Alex, uh, you're you're flashing us. I know. Alex is being uh, beamed up to the enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, are we uh, ready to sign off? I think we are. It looks like we got all the questions. And uh, Ron, thanks again so much. And you're welcome. Uh, we kind of stay here a little bit longer after the show after we close the online show. You're welcome to join us or not. Yeah, I will. Great. Well, Molly you can take us out. All righty. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. See you next week. Okay.